Hello, good morning, and welcome to Nature Live from the Natural History Museum. I'm Khalil Thurlaway. These talks are usually in the Attenborough studio at the museum, but while our doors may be shut for the time being, we still want to provide you with an inside peek at the science and the people that make the museum what it is. My guest today studies a particular group of social insects, and if any of you were watching our late show at the end of May, these might be familiar to you. That's right, these are termites. And to tell us more, I've got Joel Woon on the line, who studies these insects here at the museum. Hi, Joel. How's it going? Hi, I'm good, thank you. So, to start us off, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do at the museum? Um, so, I'm a PhD researcher. I uh, share my time between the museum in London and the University of Liverpool. And for the last couple of years or so, I've just been working on studying termites uh, for my PhD thesis. And have you always been into termites or how did you end up studying them? Um, so I haven't, I didn't really know what termites were or what they did until I was about 21. Um, I, in my undergrad degree, I really enjoyed insects. I, I thought they're just completely alien. They're the most unique things on the planet. Um, and I really wanted to study them. So when I went into my master's degree, I really wanted to do a project on insects. Um, but I kind of randomly got um, given a project on termites. And after meeting my supervisor and doing a bit of reading um, around termites and then going out to Borneo to study them, I just completely fell in love uh, with termites. So you were a, you know, a proper adult before you realized that termites are not just silly looking ants. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's quite an understandable um, mistake to make. They look very similar. They're, they're sort of these insects that live in huge colonies. Um, and yeah, they've got six legs, they run around on the floor and they're a bit creepy and gross sometimes, uh, but they are actually completely different. So before we go into the, the real meat of the content, one thing I wanna mention for our audience at home is that we'd love to hear from you guys as well. So if you've got any questions today, please do pop them in the comment section and we'll try and come to as many as we can in the time we've got. But let's go on with the, with the talk. So let's start off you know, and you mentioned uh, early on that they're, they're similar but different uh, from ants. So why don't you tell us what is a termite and how does how is it different from an ant? Um, so ants and termites are actually completely unrelated. Uh, they're from different orders of insects. So they're a different, different part of the taxonomic tree, the tree of life. They're about as related as we are to something like an elephant or a lion, um, despite looking so similar. Um, so one of the things that um, uh, termites do best is breaking down dead plant matter. So they eat logs and uh, leaves that have fallen to the floor and sometimes grass and things like that. Whereas ants uh, fulfill a much wider range of roles. Um, so ants can be carnivores, or they can be herbivores, some of them eat seeds, and some of them do do a bit of decomposition like termites do. Um, but they're, but termites are much more narrow in the range of uh, jobs that they do for the ecosystem in which they live. And in fact, we've already had a question uh, from Adam would like to know if they're not related to ants, what are some of the closest insect relatives to termites? Um, so they're actually most closely related to cockroaches. Um, so they're essentially blind uh, colonial versions of cockroaches. That might come as a bit of a surprise for to quite a few people because they look so different from them. Yeah, um, it, it came as a surprise to me when I was researching it. Um, it's I think it's really interesting. It shows how um, different things can evolve to look very similar when they're actually completely unrelated when you look at ants and termites. And another of the big differences between ants and termites is that we're all familiar with a kind of ant hill and ants nest, which is a little mound and then <laughs> of tunnels underneath where they live. But termites are kind of famous for the types of nests that they build, right? Yeah, so if you've never seen a termite before, you probably have seen a termite mound. Um, they're very famous because you see them all over African savannas. So if you've ever seen a picture of an elephant or a giraffe, it's quite likely that there might be a termite mound somewhere nearby in that photo. And that termite mound, I mean, it's hard to tell by scale, but next to those trees, it looks pretty tall. Yeah, that one's huge. I, I guess that's probably about four or five meters tall. Um, so that's to the termites, the equivalent of the same height as the 
Burj Khalifa. Um, and that, the Burj Khalifa is that really, really tall skyscraper in, in, I think, Dubai. Yes. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And so that's an equivalent height for a termite. But they managed to build that sometimes in as little as uh, six months to one year. Wow. So how how do they kind of organize their society? We've got a question from uh, from George, uh, who's asking if you know if, if they have a, a queen just like ants in their colony. Yeah, absolutely. So um, a termite colony has a number of different roles or a different number of different jobs, uh, and we call them castes. Um, so the most common um, cast of uh, individual in a termite colony are the workers. So these do basically all the hard jobs in the colony. Um, so they build the mound, they will go and retrieve resources like dead wood, um, but they'll also take care of the young. The second most common uh, cast are the soldiers. Uh, so their main role is to defend the colony against any attacker. Um, and they do this in a variety of different ways, depending on the species. Um, the one that you can see here is found in South America. Um, and what's that? What's that long, <laughs> pointy thing on its head? Because we can see the big jaws there. But mm -hmm. so most termite predators are actually ants. Termites are a really good resource for things to eat um, because there's so many, and you can find them in a very, very common place. You just find a mound, and you find a load of termites. Um, so they need some pretty hardcore uh, defenses to try and protect themselves from these predators. Um, and this unicorn-like spike at the top of this termite's head uh, is a really, really effective way of defending itself against ants because it acts kind of like a water gun. So it fires acid out of that um, long spike, wow. um, which essentially can prevent ants from getting close to them uh, and, yeah, protecting the colony. But as you can see, if ants do get close, they then have a, a second tact, which are these huge hooked mandibles. Imagine from, you know, looking at that image, imagine if you were an ant coming towards that termite colony and you're faced with this kind of acid spraying, big sharp jaw having a uh, soldier that's defending you. Yeah, you'd think twice. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and there's, we've had a few people asking, um, so the, you know, there are, there are some types of ants, uh, like army ants and stuff that have even within their, their soldiers, they have different kind of types of soldier, like super majors and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Do we see that level of organization in termites? Yeah, so it depends on the species. Um, but usually, uh, if there is another division within soldiers and workers, you get two types. So you get a minor soldier and a major soldier. Um, and these are usually, one is quite small and one is quite big. And they have quite similar um, tactics so if they have this unicorn like spike both the soldiers will have the unicorn spike um or if they only have big mandibles they will both have big mandibles but because they're different sizes they can tackle different predators uh, so the small ones are usually against small insects uh, and other invertebrates whereas the big ones are quite good at trying to attack larger predators like mammals so let's let's go on to one size bigger from the soldier. Mm -hmm. What's the next role that we're going to look at in the colony? So the next one, and probably the most important individual, uh, are queens. So like George asked, that there, there are queens in termite um, colonies, but they're quite different to ant queens. Um, so in this picture, the big sort of beige sausage thing that you can see in the middle is actually the termite queen. So they start off relatively small. Um, I mean, still bigger than a worker, but they can run around and things and they find a king. Um, they'll burrow down into the ground and then their abdomen will start to swell. So that's the bit at the back of the termite. And it so, so here in this image, the big sausagey thing in the middle is the abdomen of the queen. Where yes. is the, where's her head? It's sort of the bottom left of that um, photo. There's sort of dark. Yes, exactly where the pointer is. So that's the, the queen's head. And then um, that other large individual on the other end of her abdomen. Yes. So that's, that's the king. king. Yeah. So this queen starts out the size of that king. And then uh, when they begin to reproduce, her abdomen swells and becomes a, an egg factory, essentially. So that whole abdomen there, which can grow 
to in the biggest species 10 centimeters long um is essentially just a a, a bunch of machinery to pump out as many eggs as possible and in this image so we can see the queen and the king in the center surrounded by mostly workers it looks like mm -hmm. and then some of the larger soldiers with those those big sharp mandibles at the front yeah and are these little white ones um so they're the nymphs they're the the termite young essentially um one of the big differences between ants and termites is that the young actually contribute in a termite colony um in ants the egg uh, changes into a larva and that has to be fed uh, by the workers but in termites uh, the the young as soon as they hatch out their egg they're functioning they're not quite as effective as the adult workers, but they can still help out with things like uh, brood control and helping catching other eggs. Putting their children to work, just like the Victorians. <laughs> not, maybe not the best analogy. For <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think we've got another uh, slide coming up about how, do, how does the, the queen and the king end up starting a colony? How do they get there? So the last cast are alates. Um, and, and this is a term that means winged, right? Yes, absolutely. So the, when a termite colony wants to reproduce, um, they don't want to keep it in the colony because that leads to inbreeding and um, the colony will die. So what they do is they produce thousands of these winged termites, which all at the same time, at the same time as every colony in the area, they will all fly out of the mound, usually after it's rained or while it's raining, uh, and they'll pair up with uh, an individual of, a, from a different colony of the opposite gender, and then they'll burrow into the ground and begin begin a new colony, hopefully. And when, when the, the queen develops into this big sausage egg factory, um, Reese is asking, how many eggs can she produce? Um, so this, again, depends on the species, but they are, it is all they're built for. They have been sort of honed and adapted to just produce as many eggs as possible. So the fastest uh, laying termite queen can lay an egg every second, um, which yeah. I don't really want to try and calculate how many that is in a year, uh, but it's it's a lot, a, a huge number of eggs. Well, yeah, talk about labor. <laughs> uh, what, do we know what turns a, 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 a larva into either a worker, a soldier, or one of these alate mating forms? Yeah, so with most species of termite, um, when you're born, you can either become a worker or a soldier or, an, or a reproductive alate. Um, there are a couple of species where the worker, if the queen dies, can take its place. Um, but usually that role is defined for you when you're born. But if you are gonna become either a soldier or a worker, uh, that depends on hormones and pheromones that are released into the colony. Um, so these are pheromones are like smelly chemicals that yeah they so, are other other members of your your colony, right? Absolutely. So termites are blind. Uh, I forgot to mention that at the top. That's a big difference between them and ants, um, or most of them are anyway. Um, so they need to use chemicals to sort of figure out exactly where other termites are and uh, communicate with each other. And one of these pheromones um, sort of dictates the proportion of the population that turns into a soldier. And usually this is really quite um, sort of set in stone. You can go and open up as many termite mines as you want. And depending on which species it will be, there'll be a specific number of soldiers within that colony. But I guess uh, what if the colony is coming under a lot, a lot of attack, would they start to produce more soldiers or...? Um, so that doesn't seem to affect the number of soldiers. Uh, my supervisor's done a couple of experiments where they've tried to influence how many soldiers should be made, and it doesn't seem to make an impact. Um, so, but it's it's one of those things that we're not still not 100% sure how it works. Um, we've had a few questions coming in from our uh, viewers who are wondering whether we get termites in the UK. Um, we don't, which... I guess you would say it's fortunate because they're not meant to live here um, and they've managed, we've managed to keep them out so far. Um, termites are extremely successful, so they're quite good at invading um, places that they shouldn't be. Um, so we're quite lucky that we haven't had them. 
and it also human, humans are quite good at accidentally introducing species to places yes yeah especially termites all you need to do is bring a box that has some in it's they, they they're in the walls of the box or something and you put it down and they're into the ecosystem um but yeah so, so if they don't, don't live happen, in the UK, yeah. what sort of places do they live? What sort of habitats do they like? Um, so they live in quite a wide range of habitats with one usually um, key feature is that it's hot. Um, so they live anywhere that's tropical or subtropical, really. Um, the place that we think most of these species evolve currently are in tropical forests. So rainforests um, and seasonal rainforests. Um, this provides a really good habitat for termites because there's a lot of dead wood around, there's a lot of leaf litter, uh, and it's nice and warm and humid. But um, they've also managed to evolve to uh, infiltrate places like savannas. Um, so they're a lot hotter and they're drier, but termites still live there. This is probably where you know them from. But they've even managed to um, colonize places like deserts. So there's some specific species that are really quite hardy um, and they can live in really low water content environments. And I guess if you're going to try and survive in a dry environment like a desert or savanna, where the temperature changes from you know very hot in the day to very cold at night, you've got to build yourself a house. And this yeah. is quite famous for. Yeah, exactly. So that's one of the um, one of the reasons that they build this huge mound uh, is partly to protect themselves from the outside conditions. Um, there are a couple of other ways that you can do that, like just living underground. So there are some savanna species that you could walk through a savanna and never see because they spend their whole lives underneath the ground. Um, but anything that creates quite a large colony needs one of these mounds because it functions almost like a lung. Um, so the way that we get oxygen into our bodies is just by breathing in and we've got um, some apparatus that removes CO2 and gives us more oxygen. And that's exactly what some of these mounds are doing. So there's lots of tiny, tiny holes in the sides of these mounds, which allows the CO2 to be pulled out by the air and then um, oxygen to enter the mound to prevent the whole colony from just suffocating. And so what, it's a kind of circulatory sort of chimney system almost. Yeah, exactly. So there's a whole variety of different um, tube sizes so some of them have a big middle chimney which is quite similar to our throat or our esophagus and then these tubes get smaller and smaller um like our bronchioles and things like that so it is really quite analogous to to our lungs that's amazing and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes don't they yeah so absolutely we're seeing kind of quite solid chunky ones with with spires on the top yeah so yeah so this is um Macrotermes, there's a species, and the same species built both of these mounds. So even within one species, the size and shape of their mound can be quite different. The one on the right actually is the tallest mound that I've ever seen, and that that was over five meters tall. Because we can see a, a human in the in the side of the, yeah. <laughs> the scale. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's amazing that, that these massive. tiny organisms, these tiny little blind termites, can build something so huge. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely amazing. It's one of the things that um, attracts me and quite a lot of people to study these, these creatures. So as well as building these huge, great cathedral looking uh, mounds, they also build some other kind of less familiar shaped ones. So look at these little, there's a the little dumpy one on the left and the little gooey looking one on the right. Why don't you talk mm. us through this? Sure. So the one on the left is found in a savanna like those big ones were. Um, but these are a completely different species of termite um, and their colony is a lot smaller. So they don't need quite as large amount uh, to recycle the, the air inside their, their structure. So they don't need it to be quite as big. But if you try to break into that, it is still very hard. It's quite hard to get into. Um, and then the one on the right uh, is actually found in a tropical forest. Um, most termite mounds uh, function are, are built in certain ways to do three things. One is to recycle the, the gases and make sure that they don't suffocate. Uh, one is to protect themselves from predators, so that's why they're so hard. And the last is to prevent the colony from drowning. So if you live on or in the ground and a big rainfall happens, um, the whole colony can die quite quickly. 
And that's what this one on the right is doing quite effectively. It's using the tree as a structure to build itself off the ground um, so that if it does rain quite extensively, they won't drown. Yeah, because in the rainforest, the, the groundwater level can change huge yeah. in some cases. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, they, they're called a rainforest for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> and there are, there are some colonies that, in my opinion, are even weirder looking, but I, I love them. Um, mm. These weird mushroomy ones. Yeah, so um, these are some of my favorite mounds. Um, they're so surreal to see in the forest. You can just be walking through and you'll see a huge wooden or sort of a mix of wood and mud uh, mushroom, which looks like someone has built almost uh, in a very accurate carbon copy. Um, but these uh, sort of mushroom tops are another way that they protect themselves from flooding and from the rain. Um, they essentially remove all the water from the top of the mound and they deposit it around the sides. Um, like an umbrella. Try... Exactly like an umbrella, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, they try and prevent the termite colony that's in the middle there from getting flooded uh, and getting drenched. Why do they have several umbrellas? Is it just for extra safety or...? Um, so, because it rains so much in rainforests, that top one will get worn after a while. So if it starts getting holes in, like the, the one on the left, you can see kind of, it's got a couple of holes in the top. Um, they'll probably go and build an additional additional mushroom cap or an additional umbrella on top so that no water can get in. So these are, these are all amazing structures for, for in different ways and for different reasons, but how do, how do they build them? Because yeah, you know, we've had a, had a couple of questions from our viewers actually about how they communicate and coordinate to build something so big, and and also whether their bodies have any specific adaptations to build these structures. Um, so yeah, it's actually a little bit of a mystery. Um, what the prevailing theory initially was that um, some of these pheromones or chemicals can be released in their spit. So they go and they find some mud that would be good to build a mound with, and they create a little ball. Um, and then the workers will go and deposit this ball somewhere. Um, and people want to know how they know where to put this ball. And they thought that it was because they put um, some, some pheromones and some chemicals into the ball as they place it, which encourages other termites to then place their, their little mud balls on top of the previously placed one. Um, but there's been a couple of experiments done recently which has actually suggested that this isn't the case. So it's a really cool mystery as how small, unintelligent insects uh, come together to create something so huge wow. and so complex. It's, yeah, it's one of the, the biggest mysteries in termite biology at the moment. Well, I guess if any of you at home want to do a PhD in termite <laughs> Time to apply for grants. <laughs> yeah. It would be really useful as well because people want to um, use the same sort of rules that you could program a termite to do to program robots. And then you could theoretically um, create a whole sort of robot term, termite cast that could go and create huge complex structures uh, with just a few commands. But they've not figured it out yet. So. Uh, if you like robots or termites or both, it would be certainly a, a, an interesting avenue to take. Robot termites, there's definitely a TV show in there somewhere. <laughs> and uh, these, these structures can be really, really strong. Like, they can support the weight of a, of a fully grown human. Yeah, yes, and yeah, and I'm quite a, a large human. Um, they're, they're absolutely massive. They're, these walls are designed to keep predators out that have massive claws and, um, and yeah, some really good ways to try and delve into it. They're, they're so strong that in some cases you would need a JCB or a jackhammer to try and break the wall. Um, wow. And yeah. we've got a question from Seth, actually, one of our viewers, who's wanting to know what sorts of animals uh, will predate, will eat termites. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, ants are probably the most common one. Um, but loads of mammals eat termites. Um, as I said, they are such a good food source because you know exactly where they're going to be. And when you get inside that termite mound, you essentially have an all you can eat buffet of small insects. So if that's your your thing, if you like that taste, then they're absolutely perfect. So what so, are we talking? We're still talking aardvarks, anteaters, uh, yeah. other stuff. Yeah. So I, I 
Antique is a really good example. I've got, I've got a little bit of a bone to pick about the name because they actually eat mainly termites, so they should be called termite eaters. It's not quite as catchy. Doesn't quite roll off the tongue. No, <laughs> but yeah, but there's a whole host of animals. Uh, so pangolins. Um, they, pangolins are those, uh, they look a bit like an anteater, but they've got those scales. Exactly, yeah. And then sun bears, uh, numbats in Australia, aardvils in Africa. There's a whole load of animals that almost exclusively eat termites because they're so abundant. So what sort of equipment have you got to have as a predator to break into mm -hmm. a termite mound and to get the termites out? Um, so it depends on which termite you're eating, but usually it involves some pretty big claws and some good strength behind your, your arms to be able to break through the wall. And then quite a common adaptation is uh, a long snout or a very long sticky tongue or both in some cases, because then if you make a small hole in the mound, you can just stick your tongue in or stick your snout in and just suck up termites, essentially. And I guess your your tongue would have to be pretty tough if you're going to be sticking into a nest full of biting insects. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, you, you wouldn't want it to be to bleed quite easily. So what sort of tactics will the termites use to defend against these predators? Because, you know, we've said that they can you know, some of them can spray a bit of acid, some of them have got jaws, but obviously because these predators are managing to eat them, like, mm. it can't be 100% effective. How do they do it? No, but, so they are, they have, some of them have quite uh, advanced machinery to try and protect themselves, but on the whole, termites are, are fairly useless. Um, there's a couple more things that they have. Um, to defend against ants, some of them have asymmetric jaws. Um, so they have one straight jaw, uh, that sort of sticks out in front of them, and one that hooks round this jaw that flicks open and can decapitate ants. Um, wow. But, yeah, which is really cool. That's metal. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it's not that effective, uh, unfortunately. If you miss with your first hit, then you're, you're probably dead. Um, there's some that out of the hole in their head, they ooze a glue, and they essentially <laughs> accept that this soldier is going to die, but it will stick itself to as many uh, oncoming ants as possible and try and block up the hole um, that ants will try and infiltrate through. But all of these adaptations are usually suited towards defending themselves against ants because they are the main predator. So they're actually rather useless, apart from having a thick wall at defending against mammals. And pretty much the only thing that they can do is make themselves taste bad so as they get consumed by a mammal, they will release a pheromone that basically makes the mammal's mouth taste kind of like gone off lemon, like a, an acrid, acidy taste. And eventually the mammal will get bored and leave. And I guess you're also relying on having a lot of individuals in your colony. Yeah. Uh, if, you know, if a predator comes along and eats a few hundred, actually, mm. a bigger deal. Uh, yeah, well, even a few. I have a couple mouths. of questions actually about how many individuals you might get in a colony. Yeah, so it depends on the species, um, but usually at least uh, a few thousand individuals in your colony, up to order of millions. So a microtermes colony with that huge mound can support two to three million individuals. Wow, that's that, you know, and in that case, you can. I guess you can absorb the losses of a, an anteater coming along and yeah, eating a few absolutely. hundred for, for breakfast. Yeah, if you people view um, termite colonies as a super organism, so they see it as one creature. So if you lose a few of the individuals, your creature, your colony is still alive. <coughs> so it's not the end of the world. And how long can this super organism live for? Um, so it usually is sort of off the back of the king and queen. So however long the king and queen survive for, the col colony will live. Um, and termite queens are actually the oldest lived insect in the world. Um, so some of them can live to 50 or 60 years old, which means that individual colonies can, can hang around for that long. But even if the colony itself dies, usually the mound structure is left in place um, and a new colony can move in, either if it's been forced to move out by uh, waterlogging or an attack, or just a new king and queen can take up residence in, in an old house, essentially, which means that some of these termite mounds, um, they've been carbon dated to be almost 4,000 years old. So they oh. were around when, when the pyramids were being built, essentially. 
I guess, and they're they're a kind of similar level of architectural yeah you know, pushment. Yeah, absolutely. On the, on the subject of um, things that want to kind of break open nests, how do we look inside these termite mounds and study them? Um, yeah, so there's a couple of ways. One, you can use a sort of CT scanner, which we use to look inside a human body, um, but that's quite expensive. That's so, like a big rotating x-ray machine, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's quite hard to get one of them out into the field. So I use a pretty, a, a more scaled back uh, method, which is just getting a very, very big drill uh, and <laughs> drilling a hole down into the mound. Um, that must upset the termites a little bit. It does initially. So if you drill into a mound like this, after a couple of seconds, there will be hundreds of soldier termites spilling out of that hole. Uh, to try and attack usually the drill which doesn't go too well for them um, but if you leave it they will cover up that hole and they'll be happy after a, a few minutes essentially can soldier termites hurt humans have you ever had a nip yeah i mean i've had minor injuries they're not i um so one of the ways that you sample insects is by using a little pot with a tube on the end and you suck them up um, I once sucked up a termite and it came through the tube and managed to attach itself to my lip, which caused it to, <laughs> to bleed and swell up. Um, and I've had a few bite my fingers and things, and they can draw blood. They, they have very strong jaws for the size uh, of insect they are, but none of them are poisonous or venomous to, to humans. They, you, you won't, uh, unless you eat too many, you, you, won't be, you, won't hurt. you won't get hurt. So once you've drilled a hole, through the outside of the mound, uh, what what can we learn from inside there? How do we do we use cameras? Do we use stuff like that? Yeah, so you can stick a camera down, but it's completely dark, so you'd have to send a, a, a light in with it. But what I do is I put some sensors in there. I want to try and find out how hot and humid it is, uh, and compare it to the outside world to see whether or not the termites are controlling their environment. Um, but yeah, here I took a few photos. This was a few a couple of minutes after. Um, I drilled a hole. You can see the large termites around the outside. They're the soldiers coming to, uh, to coming to try and ward me off. But then also um, around the left hand side, there's some sort of darker brown mud. And if you look quite closely, they're in sort of little balls. They're the things that the workers are coming to try and cover up this hole. So this is both a defense and repair crew. Yeah, absolutely. So the it's soldiers just, um... there, are just they're defending the workers so they'll stay there they'll stay pretty still and then if i touched one of them it would just start biting over and over again i mean it's a it's a beautiful picture but i i'm pretty sure i've had nightmares that look a lot <laughs> yeah i i've definitely had a few nightmares of termites growing inside me they're they're pretty so let's take take let's take a little deeper dive inside the the mound um so this is i'm guessing one of the bigger central chambers yeah, so this is one of the um, large corridors or large chimneys that is used to expel heat and carbon dioxide. Um, but there's a whole host of different chambers that you find inside a termite mount. Um, quite a lot of them are for this, for the functioning of the lung structure. But some of them are used for brood care, so all the eggs get put in there um, so that the workers can uh, essentially help the whole lot. But probably the most famous chamber in a termite mound is the royal cell. Um, so the royal cell is where the king and queen initially built. So when they burrow into the ground, they will build their own royal cell. And at the time, they are big enough, uh, they're small enough rather, to get in and out of that cell. But as the queen swells and grows and that abdomen becomes that huge sausage, um, she'll no longer be able to escape. Um, so everything other than laying eggs has to be done for her. So the workers have to bring her food, water, and remove the eggs. She is essentially stationary, locked inside her own mound. It's kind of like the honeymoon suite. <laughs> kind of, if you could, if you could never leave. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a locked honeymoon suite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's let's go delving further into the termite mound. Um, without wanting to use too technical a term. What's all that white stuff? <laughs> so this is um, fungus. Um, there's a group of termites that are really successful in Africa and Asia, which actually grow a fungus. So they're one of the first ever farmers uh, on, on our planet. 
and they essentially they go out and they uh, find dead wood and they bring that dead wood to this fungus, which then breaks down uh, the wood and then they eat the fungus and the things that the fungus excretes. Um, so they get all the, the fungus to do all the heavy lifting, essentially. Um, we've talked a lot about the differences between ants and termites, but actually there are some species of ant that also farm fungus, like uh, the leafcutter ant. Yeah, it's quite interesting because the leafcutter ants are in South America, where you don't get any fungus farming termites, and the fungus farming termites are in Africa and Asia, where you don't get leafcutter ants. Um, there are a couple of differences. Oh, go Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so the termites feed, or they feed the, the fungus deadwood and litter, whereas um, the leafcutter ants go for leaves. The sort of the, the the really cool images of them carrying back super big and very green pieces of, of leaf, whereas that would kill this sort of fungus. It's amazing that you know, these these two unrelated groups of insects have both managed to evolve similar strategies to overcome the same problems. Totally yeah. Completely. Yeah, and I, I think it's one of the things that feeds into this um, misunderstanding that ants and termites are closely related. Um, they do similar things and they look quite similar, but they're actually like really far apart in, in, on the uh, tree of life, uh, which is super interesting. So it's sort of a very good example of how two different things can evolve to look similar and fulfill similar roles, but actually be very different. And you actually managed to extract uh, some of the fungus from one of these mounds, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, it looks really cool. Um, I think it looks like a little brain, which uh, is yeah, yeah, it's quite a good um, sort of metaphor for the mound, really, because that is exactly kind of what dictates what the termites want to do. Uh, they want to feed this so that the the colony can survive and grow. So we've been talking a little bit about how you study termites and stuff, but what are you actually trying to find out with your research, Joel? Um, so the main parts of my research are looking at how termites are going to be impacted by climate change. Um, they're extremely important for the natural ecosystems that they're in. Um, so in some places, they break down 50% of all the leaf litter and dead wood that you find. Um, and they're so important that they're called ecosystem engineers uh, in some parts of the world. So they actually create the ecosystems that we see when you take a photo of a savanna and you see all these termite mounds um, around. They are a very important part of creating the diversity of plants and animals in that ecosystem. And so I guess recycling nutrients is really important. Turning yeah. from dead into a uh, form that it can be reused by other organisms. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in some ecosystems, they're the only agent that does that. In these sort of semi-arid savannas, fungus can't grow, it is too dry. Um, so you'd need termites there to be able to break down um, the dead plant matter so that more plants can grow. So understanding how climate change might change the conditions that termites experience is really important. But also termites, um, as we know are pests, so they eat um, a lot of infrastructure, especially in, it's, it gets a lot of press in America. Apparently they cause $5 billion worth of damage each year in America. Um, but also in other parts of the world, they're a massive pest to farmers. Um, they can kill whole crops, uh, which can really impact the sort of smallholder farms in Africa and Asia. Um, so understanding how those termites are gonna be how they might change their distribution um, or whether they might become more um, efficient under climate change is really important uh, for those people. So on the subject of, of how the environment and changes in the environment could affect termites, um, Amelia, one of our viewers, is asking if, if the mound uh, gets very hot or very cold, just like the outside environment, because I guess part of the reason they're building this house is to protect from that. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I'm looking at is um, putting these sensors inside termite mounds and comparing it to a sensor that's outside a termite mound. And on the sort of initial results and from a couple of experiments that other people have done, we can see that the temperature stays quite 
constant. So it doesn't fluctuate or it doesn't change that much inside the termite mound. And neither does the humidity. Um, so termites are essentially small, like squishy bags of water. And if it dries, they will die very quickly. So inside that mound, it is very humid, even if outside it's quite dry. Well, you know, just like in our homes, in the winter, we try and warm it up. In the summer, we try and cool it down. Exactly. They've essentially built their aircon and their yeah. thing. Yeah, so there was actually a building in Ethiopia that was built based on a termite mound, which doesn't use air conditioning units in Ethiopia to try and cool it down. And it's been pretty successful. It has a massive chimney through the top, which pulls out the hot air and cold air comes in uh, through the bottom. It's really interesting. Wow, then you know maybe that could that kind of like bio-inspired and nature-inspired design could lead us to a more energy-efficient way of keeping ourselves cool. Because at the moment, in a lot of hot places in the world, we're using huge amounts of electricity mm. energy to to cool down the inside of buildings. Yeah, um, we're going to try and have a more sustainable energy use as a society. If we can just get the buildings to cool themselves, mm. maybe we can learn a lot from termites. No, absolutely. And then uh, termites are quite interesting on this front in another way, in that they're one of the few animals that can convert wood and uh, plant matter directly into energy, um, which if we were able to do, uh, we wouldn't need to rely so heavily on fossil fuels to, to fuel our energy grids or our cars and things like that. So far, we haven't been as successful as termites, um, but there's quite a lot of people working on it. And sticking to the, the topic of, of how climate change might interact with, with termites, um, we've had a question from a, a viewer, Carl, on YouTube, asking why is it that we don't get termites in the UK and, and could they adapt to the UK climate? Or if the UK climate changes because of climate change, changes because of climate change, <laughs> with termites in the UK? Um, yeah, I think theoretically they could, could probably live here now. The, there is one species that is invasive to France and it's got to northern France. So the climate between southern England and northern France isn't too different. Um, the thing that we have going for us is that we're an island and termites are pretty ineffective at moving over bodies of water. Um, the reason that they've managed to so far is because they evolved millions of years ago. And so just through luck, they, are, they have been able to get to South America and to Australia. Um, but yeah, so the climate isn't ideal for termites. It's a bit cold in the winter at the moment, but with climate change, it could feasibly become um, a pretty ideal spot for termites. And uh, we've got a question from Emma about the, the kind of the, the colonial nature of termites. And she wants to know, if a termite got separated from its colony, could it survive on its own? How long would it survive for? Um, it wouldn't survive for very long at all. They, they really do require um, the whole colony. I think it's one of the main differences that you see in ants. That a lot of ant species have solitary um, foragers. So they send out their uh, soldiers to go and look for, look for resources. Uh, termites can't do that. They, they are useless without, without the whole force of the colony behind them. But when they do have that, they're quite formidable. Well, I think you know there's a lot we can learn from termites, whether it's from how to keep our buildings cool or you know the fact that we need to rely on each other as a community to, to come through yeah, the, the slightly adverse times we're experiencing at the moment. But thank you so much, Joel. Uh, it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Yes, it's been great fun. Thank you ever so much for having me. <sighs> Anytime. Um, thank you so much, Joel. Goodbye. Cheers. Bye-bye. And thank you at home for joining us as well. Um, I've had an amazing time. I hope you've enjoyed it too. Uh, please do uh, tune in next Tuesday when we'll be going live at 12, uh, 12 noon and we're going to be talking about butterflies. Uh, we, are, we have Nature Live online shows every Tuesday and Friday. Um, and you can also keep an eye on our social media channels. We are on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, and at nhm.ac.uk. Until then, thank you very much. I've been Khalil Thurlaway, that was Joel Woon, and this has been Nature Live Online from the Natural History Museum. Thanks and goodbye.